wrote books that are named after them, lived after the time of the divided kingdom. We divide them into three groups, the pre-exilic prophets, the exilic prophets, and the post-exilic prophets. Thus far, we uh, have worked out, we've examined Joel and Jonah, and right now we're working to a group of prophets who are all contemporaries and had complementary messages. Amos and Hosea in the north, Micah and Isaiah in the south. All four of these prophets lived and prophesied during the 8th century B.C. That's between 800 B.C. and 700 B.C. And when we talk about them having complementary messages, what we mean is this. Amos rebuked the Israelites for their sins against their fellow man, while Hosea rebuked them for their sins against God. Both are important. Sometimes we evangelicals get hung up on sins against God. Well, I'm glad we are hung up on those, but God is also concerned about social justice. And in the South, the same sort of situation exists. Micah spoke out against social injustice. He rebuked the men and women of the southern kingdom for the sins against their fellow man, while Isaiah focused more intently on their sins against God. There is always overlap. All of them speak about everything. It's the nature. It's the nature of, of, of Middle Eastern thought. Western thought, and I'll talk more about this probably next way when we get into Isaiah. In Western thought, we're sort of sequential. We start with A, and then we go to B, and we go to C. I think that way, you think that way. And because of that, we put together a thing called systematic theology, which is, helps us take all the information around the Bible and line it up the way we Westerners think. Easterners don't think that way. Easterners don't think that way. The best way to describe Eastern thought is go out on a very clear, starry night and look at the stars. Because what they do is they take their information, they throw it all up. It's like stars in the skies. They'll think about this one, they'll think about that one. Not putting it down, it's just different way of thinking. I had a friend who was a graduate student at Columbia in New York. He says, if you think it's bad in the Middle East, he was a Chinese literature culture student. He says, go to China and figure out the way they think. We don't all think the same way. That's the point I'm trying to make. What has that got to do with this? The Bible is an Eastern book, or Middle Eastern book. And uh, while we talk about themes in books, you have to remember that all of them talk about everything. It's just a certain emphasis. Amos will emphasize social injustice, but he'll still talk about idolatry and sins against God. The same deal with Hosea. He'll, the emphasis is going to be on... Uh, sins against God, but he'll also talk about social injustice and so forth. All right, we are working our way through these four right now. Thus far, we've examined, to a certain extent, the, the, uh, the books of Joel, Jonah, Amos, and Hosea. The memory aid for Joel was locusts because there had been a, a plague of locusts. And it inundated the land, and Joel came on the scene and said, those locusts are here because your sinful behavior is going to get worse if you don't clean up their, your act. They did not clean up their act, and they got worse. Jonah, memory aid is a fish, and we all know why. God told him to go to Assyria and preach against it. He didn't want to. Instead, he got on a ship going to Tarshish. Didn't work out well. Ended up in the belly of a fish. Decided going to Assyria maybe wasn't that bad after all or the city of Nineveh, which is the capital city of of Assyria. Amos is the first of these two prophets in the north. He was a herdsman from Tekoa in the southern kingdom, and God called him to the northern kingdom to preach against their social injustice. We've already talked about that. And in our last session together, we spent some time talking about Hosea, who was a living sermon. God told Hosea to marry a prostitute who would be unfaithful to him, and he was to be a living sermon because God had married a prostitute, an adulteress called Israel, who'd been unfaithful to him by worshiping other gods. He was a living sermon. This evening, we're going to examine the prophet Micah. He is a prophet in the southern kingdom, a contemporary of Isaiah, and uh, he will be speaking out of social injustice, man's sin against man. He was a country preacher. He wasn't a trained prophet. A country preacher who attacked attacked social injustice. How did those pictures come out? They came out pretty good, didn't they? I never see this. So occasionally I need to turn around and look, see what you're getting and look at. One day I did that and realized you weren't getting a very good picture. (laughs) He was a country preacher. He attacked social injustice. He spoke out against false prophets. Now we're going to find that most of these prophets had trouble with 
prophets. These prophets, as we've said on a number of occasions, came out and criticized the people for their sinful behavior, warned them that they would be punished if they continued in their sinful behavior, pleaded with them to repent, saying God would bless them if they repented. But if they didn't repent, there would be severe judgments. And then they would end up talking about the Millennial Kingdom. They all love talking about the Millennial Kingdom. I love talking about the Millennial Kingdom. I want the Millennial Kingdom now. So do you, if you've got any sense at all. Now, he spoke out against, and so there and there, these prophets, Micah and Isaiah and Hosea and all of these wonderful prophets are out making, uh, giving sermons that God has told them to give. Meanwhile, the false prophets are saying, don't pay any attention to those fundamentals, those evangelicals. They don't know what they're talking about. And that was his problem. No matter what he said, there will always be other false prophets who in the name of Jehovah would say, don't listen to Micah. So false prophets were a problem. We will spend a lot of time with talking about false prophets when we get to Jeremiah because he had a major tr trouble, a major problem with false prophets. He spoke out against false prophets. He spoke out against corrupt judges. And he spoke out against religious, religious hypocrisy because there were lots of men and women in Israel who claimed to be true worshipers of Jehovah but they were hypocrites. He predicted the destruction of Samaria and Jerusalem. If you look at this timeline, you see he lived down here. Uh, about the time, he lived in, in between 800 B.C. and 700 B.C., so he spoke ahead of time about the Assyrian captivity, and probably he saw it. He was alive when it took place, so he saw his prophecy being fulfilled. He did not see his prophecy being fulfilled about the Babylonian captivity. He spoke out against both. In Micah 1.6, he said, Therefore I will make Samaria, which was the capital of the northern kingdom, a heap of rubble, a place for planting vineyards. I will pour her stones into the valley and lay, her, lay bare her foundations. So he's in there. Keep in mind, he's, he's, he's rebuking them for their sinful behavior. Stop sinning, stop sinning, pleading with them to repent. Uh, they re he knew they would refuse to repent, so he said, what's going to happen is I'm going to destroy your kingdom. Samaria, your capital city, and with that your government and your nation will be a heap of rubble. And about the south, he said this, Therefore, because of you, Zion, will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble. And it was indeed during the time of the Babylonian captivity. The temple hill, a mound overgrown with thickets. There were a lot of Old Testament prophets that made predictions that came true in the Old Testament, which, as many scholars have pointed out, is good reason to believe them today when they talk about the tribulation that's coming. Important passages. Micah 4, 3. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. This is a passage of Scripture you're familiar with because it's also repeated in Joel and in Isaiah. And any time you read about uh, swords being beaten into plowshares, what period of time are we talking about? The millennium. And when we talk about plowshares being beaten into swords, we're talking about Armageddon. Because we had a discussion in Joel about Armageddon. You'll beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. But what God went, but with the reverse is the millennium. This is only going to take place during the millennium. So he doesn't say, oh, by the way, this is a, a, a millennial kingdom passage. You have to sort of figure out that from what's being said. So anytime you read this, this is only going to take place in the millennium. The church is not going to usher this in. They tried that for the last, for the first 1,500 years of the church. It didn't work. Then there's Micah 5, 2. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrata, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will come forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Now, this is an important passage in Micah. This was the passage that uh, the religious leaders in Jerusalem read to the Magi when they came to Jerusalem looking for the, for uh, the birth of the Jewish Messiah. Remember the Magi, the time of Christ, who following the star, they came to Jerusalem. Where is he who's going to be born king of the Jews? The religious leaders turned to the Old Testament scrolls and read to them Micah 5 2. As for you, Bethlehem of Frat. What's interesting is only Bethlehem of Frat is only about six miles south of Jerusalem. The Magi, the Gentiles, went, the religious leaders did not. There's talk about spiritual bankruptcy. And these are the religious leaders who knew that he was going to be born in Bethlehem of Friday. Now, the reason 
he's included the word Ephrata. Is there's really there's, it's, it's because there are two Bethlehems in Israel. One is south of Jerusalem, about six miles. The other is in Galilee, about seven miles northeast of Nazareth. And how you distinguish the two is with the word Ephrata. Ephrata is an ancient name for the town of Bethlehem. So when Micah, when Micah said, as for you, Bethlehem Ephrata, the, the scholars knew exactly which one he was talking about. He was talking about the one that was south of Jerusalem. So that's the reason for that. Bethlehem means house of bread. Ephrata means fruitful. And indeed, it was a house of bread. The bread of life gave, came from there. Was, David was born there. King David, and Jesus as well. And here it says, From you one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. This tells us he's going to be the Messiah. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity, which is points to his deity. He didn't, he didn't just begin at his birth in Bethlehem of Frata. He came from days of eternity. In other words, he's eternal. That could only be God. So the one being born, now this I, wouldn't build the whole case for the deity of Christ, but this is another passage that affirms the deity of Christ, speaks to that issue. And then finally, this third passage that is an important passage in Micah, and that passage is in chapter 6, verse 8, and it says this, What does God require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? I love this passage of Scripture. It's a wonderful passage of Scripture. And for those of you who drive through large cities that have Jewish populations, you come across this a lot because Jewish synagogues and Jewish synagogues, they love putting Micah 6, 8, and they love engraving it into the stone faces of their synagogue. What does God require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with your God? That's what he wants. All right. <clears throat> The book of Micah has basically three sermons, or three messages. Each begins with the word hear or listen, and we're going to look briefly at each of these three messages. The first one is in chapters 1 and 2, and that message or sermon is a warning of coming judgment. We've mentioned this many times. The, uh, all the prophets spoke about your sinning. If you keep sinning, God is going to punish you, so clean up your act. And, in the, and Micah is no exception. So in chapters 1 and 2, we read his first message, which was a message of coming judgment. Second message was a condemnation of the leaders and a coming deliverer. This is not a, common, a, a, a commentation of the coming deliverer. I just I, I couldn't squeeze everything else in. It's a, a condemnation of the leaders, and he's also going to tell us about a coming deliverer, the Messiah. You're laughing too much at me over there. I couldn't get it all in. <clears throat> and then the third message is a courtroom confrontation. God, this is 700 years after God had delivered the children of Israel from bondage in Egypt, taken them through the desert, married them, if you will, with the, with the Mosaic Covenant in the, at Mount Sinai, and they haven't gotten along too well. God has been faithful in providing for them, giving them the land of Canaan, giving them prosperity, and they, on the other hand, have been fairly disobedient. So God says, let's go into the court, let's have a courtroom. Let's have an imaginary courtroom. You present your problem, I'm going to present mine. And that's the third message, is, is uh, a courtroom confrontation in which each side can, can make its complaint known. All right, <clears throat> first message. It begins with, God is coming from heaven in judgment. This is Micah talking to the people. The Lord gave this message to Micah of Morsheth during the years of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. This is all 8th century B.C., when they were kings in Judah. The visions he saw concerned both Samaria and Jerusalem. Even though he's a southern prophet, he's going to make prophecies about the northern kingdom, capital city of which is Samaria, and the southern kingdom, which capital city of which is Jerusalem. Attention, let all the people of the world listen. Let the earth and everything in it hear. The sovereign Lord is making accusations against you. The Lord speaks from his holy temple. Look, the Lord is coming. He leaves his throne in heaven and tramples the heights of the earth. In other words, he's going to come down and punish you, trample you because of your sinful behavior. Point one in the first message, God is coming from heaven in judgment. Point two, God's judgment is 
is coming because of your great sins. The sins of idolatry and the sins of covetousness and theft. Sins against God, idolatry. Sins against covet of covetousness and theft. Sins against men. First, idolatry. And why is this happening? Because why is he coming from heaven to trample you? Because of the rebellion of Israel. Yes, the sins of the whole nation. Who is to blame for Israel's rebellion? Samaria is its capital city. Where the center, uh, uh, Where is the center of idolatry in Judah? Jerusalem. So he's netting both Jer Samaria and Jerusalem because both are idolatrous. Both are also filled with men and women who are ripping off their neighbors. Micah chapter 2. Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light they carry it out because it is in their power to do, do it. They covet fields and seize them, and houses and take them. They defraud a man of his home, a fellow man of his inheritance. So very quickly he said, the Lord is going to come down and trample on you. Why? Because of your idolatry both in Samaria and Jerusalem. In other words, in both the northern and southern kingdom. And because you're ripping off your neighbors. You guys lay awake at night trying to figure out how to rip your neighbor off. We're not talking about some impulsive bad behavior. We're talking about people who are plotting to do bad things to their neighbors. God doesn't like that. These judgments, third point in his first message, these judgments were ultimately fulfilled in two ways. The Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom in 722. You know about this. The Babylonians conquered the northern, uh, there should be southern kingdom. Uh, that's what happens when you hire an old man to be a teacher. The southern kingdom in 586. I need to make a note on that. Ooh. I'm, I'm glad she's awake. You should have said the same thing. First message number three. Okay. <laughs> she's witty, witty, witty. God will get you for that, though. All right. The, uh, as pointed out earlier, Micah lived in the 8th century B.C., between 800 and 700 B.C., and he was alive to see the Assyrians conquer the northern kingdom and ended as, as a nation when they did that. He was not alive to see the Babylonians conquer the southern kingdom. Micah responded to all of these predictions by weeping. Keep in mind, all of these prophets, you're going to read a lot of harsh statements from these prophets to the people rebuking them for their sinful behavior, but they love them. They love them. And he almost hated delivering the message he was compelled by God to deliver. And so he wept. Because of this, I wept and wailed. Talking about the destruction of the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. Because of this, I will weep and wail. I will go about barefoot and naked. I will howl like a jackal and moan like an owl. For her wound is incurable. It has come to Judah. It has reached the very gate of my people, even to Jerusalem itself. The people responded by telling Micah to stop preaching. Just shut up. Don't say such things, the people respond. Don't prophesy like that. Such disasters will never come our way. Does this sound familiar? It sounds familiar. You know, there have been a lot of really sound Christians preaching the coming judgment called the tribulation, and people think we're completely nuts. Just shut up. Just shut up. But if... You're told to shut up. Keep in mind you're in good company. They told Isaiah to shut up. They told Micah to shut up. They told Amos to shut up. They told Jesus to shut up. So if <clears throat> when you preach the truth, which is coming judgment, and keep in mind all of these prophets spoke out against sin and promised judgment and wrath if they didn't clean up their act, keep in mind that this is a long tradition. People don't want to hear it. And worst of all, they were supported by drunken false prophets. Suppose a prophet full of lies would say to you, I'll preach to you the joys of wine and alcohol. That's just the kind of prophet you would like. People gather around themselves, people who will tell them what they want to hear. And what is true today is true then. Which churches, who, churches supposedly Christian, uh, are filled Liberal churches are filled with preachers who are telling people what they want to hear. They don't want to hear about uh, 
uh, the sins of the LGBT movement. They don't want to hear about the sins of abortion. They don't want to hear about hell. They don't want to hear about God's wrath. They want preachers who will tell them what they want to hear. What they want are preachers who will tell them that they're fine in their sins and that God approves of them. You're okay. I'm okay. Don't worry about it. God loves you too much to ever punish you from your sinful In fact, they don't even have sinful behavior anymore. If you th- well, if you're a Republican, that's a sinful behavior. But it's pathetic. But, but this has been going on since the beginning of time. Suppose a prophet full of lies would say to you, I preach to you the joys of wine and alcohol. That's just the kind of prophet you would like. That's what they liked in 700 B.C., and that's what they like today. First message was a warning of coming judgment. His message was this. God is coming from heaven in judgment. He's going to trample you. God's judgment is coming because of your great sins. These judgments were ultimately fulfilled in two ways, with the Babylonian captivity, or the Assyrian captivity first, and then the Babylonian captivity. Micah responded to these pr- predictions by weeping. He, he, he grieved to know that the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom were going to be destroyed. The people responded to Micah by telling him to stop preaching. Shut up, Micah. We don't want to hear you. And the people were supported by drunken, false prophets, and the people still are. You preach an honest biblical message about godliness and sin and righteousness and reward and judgment and all those things, and I promise you, uh, people don't want to hear it. Second message was a condemnation of leaders and the promise of a coming deliverer, not a, coming, not a denon- the condemnation of the coming deliverer. Okay, his first point in the second message was an indictment against the leaders, the priests, and the false prophets. The leaders were cruel and heartless. I love what Ryrie said. The unjust leaders showed about as much consideration for the people as butchers do for carcasses. And if you, you know, we'll read the passage, and you'll see it's an honest reflection of what Micah wrote. I said, this is Micah, listen, you leaders of Israel, you're supposed to know right from wrong, but you are the very ones who hate good and love evil. You skin my people, I'm speaking metaphorically here, but the point's the same. You skin my people alive and tear the flesh from their bones. Yes, you eat my people's flesh, strip off their skin, and break their bones. You chop them up like meat for the cooking pot. Then you beg the Lord for help in times of trouble. Do you really expect him to answer? After all the evil you have done, he won't even look at you. So, the first element of Micah's Second message was an indictment of the leaders and the priests and the false prophets. The leaders, he tells us, were were cruel and heartless. They were as concerned about people as butchers are about carcasses. The second point of this indictment was that the false prophets lied for pay. This is what the Lord says. You false prophets are leading my people astray. You promise peace for those who give you food, but you declare war on those who refuse to feed you. Now the night will close around you, cutting off all your visions. Darkness will cover you, putting an end to your predictions. The sun will set for you prophets, and your day will come to an end. Then you seers will be put to shame, and you fortune tellers will be disgraced. And you will cover your faces because there is no answer from God. You promise peace to those who give you food to declare war on those who refuse to feed you. Now, you're looking at this and saying, well, what's the point? I mean, you, you want a prophet to give a prophecy. You want him to tell the truth. As we work our way through some of these Old Testament books on prophecy. Uh, he'll, in fact, he'll be talking in a little while about you pay prophets to tell you what you want to hear. And you're going to say, well, what's, what good is that? I mean, if, uh, it's, it's, it's their attitude toward prophets. If you go back into antiquity, most people embraced an occult idea of God. And that is an occult idea is a God in which you ma- manipulate God. Best example is voodoo in, ha- in Haiti. If you go to Haiti, or at least watch the films about Haiti and the voodoo in Haiti, they have priests and witch doctors and the like, and you pay them money, and they cut off the chicken's head, and they sprinkle blood on everything, and then they have a lot of religious rituals and mumbo-jumbo, and it wasn't designed so much to find out the truth, is what you would expect from a prophet, but to manipulate demonic powers. And that's what's going on here. 
the, uh, the Israelites want drunken prophets who will manipulate God and give them what they want. They pay prophets to perform religious rituals that will give them what they want. That will help you perhaps understand some of these passages of Scripture that otherwise don't make any sense. Uh, people, why would you want a false prophet? I mean, if, if, he's, if I come to a man and I say, you're a false prophet, I'll pay you to give me a prophecy and tell me what I want, but if you're a false prophet, you can't accurately predict the future, can you? That's not their view. It wasn't so much prediction as it was, you, but I will pay you to manipulate the future. That's not a bad deal, see? We're not talking about telling me what the future is going to hold. I'm going to give you money, you'll perform the rituals, and you will manipulate the future. This is an occult view of religion. It's an occult view of the spirit world. Sadly, some of it's crept into Christianity. And if you look at some of these wild guys on TV, they'll say, well, if you send in money, this will happen. If you pray over this, this will happen. That's manipulating God. And I promise you, that's not biblical Christianity. That's occultism. You understand the difference? Big difference here. Uh, and, and that's, well, we'll just continue on and you'll see more as we go along. So in his second message, first point was an indictment against the leaders and the priests and false prophets. The leaders were cruel and heartless. False prophets lied for pay. And then he gives us a summary against the leaders, priests, and false prophets. Listen to me, you leaders of Israel. You hate justice and twist all that is right. You're building Jerusalem on a foundation of murder and corruption. You rulers make decisions based on bribes. You priests teach laws only for a price. You prophets won't prophesy unless you're paid. So this is the idea, we'll pay you to manipulate the future. They're not paying them to accurately tell them the future. They, they're paying them to manipulate the future. This is an occult view of religion. Yet all, you claim to, all of you claim to depend on God. No harm can come to us, you say, for the Lord is here among us. They were doing all this in the name of Jehovah. You say, how could they do such a thing? Have you turned on the TV set? And these guys come up with, well, this prayer hanky, I don't know if they're doing prayer hankies anymore. You sit in this prayer handkerchief and you get, you, it has powers in it. And, 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 if, and if you do the following and you pray this kind of, there was a book out once about praying a particular prayer and you could get what you wanted. Jabez prayer, remember that? Folks, this is nonsense. That's what this bad stuff is about. I have no quarrel with Jabez. Don't misunderstand. But the idea of being able to pray a particular prayer or hold a particular handkerchief or give a certain sum of money that's, that's not prophecy. That's trying to manipulate God. That's an occult view of religion. Unfortunately, that occult view of religion has permeated religion since the beginning of time, and that's what was permeating the Jews' view of Jehovah. They were not only idolatrous, but they had an occult view of the relationship with Jehovah. I've got a prophet over here who's a false prophet with, uh, you know, with enough money. He'll manipulate Jehovah to give me what I want. Okay? That's what we're talking about here. So, second message. Point one, indictment against leaders, priests, and false prophets. Point two, the coming of the Messiah. We're back to that. They always get back to it, which is an encouraging point they always make. The coming of the Messiah in his kingdom. Jerusalem will be the capital of the world, and the Messiah will rule in peace and prosperity. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills, and people from all over the world will stream there to worship. The word mountain is a metaphor or symbol of government. As I pointed out on more than one occasion, in antiquity, uh, uh, kings and rulers like to build their cities on mountains or hills, especially their capitals. Why? Because it's a whole lot easier to fight downhill than fight uphill. If you're up on top of the hill, you just drop rocks on them. If you're at the bottom of the hill, you drop a rock, you hit your foot. So what they tried to do almost always, they would, they would build their cities on hills and then put walls around those. And in time, 
Uh, not everybody, of course, most folk were farmers and lived outside of the city. And when the enemies came, they would all run to the city. And that gave the folks in the city control over the farmers in the surrounding area. So that became the seats of government. So in time, the word mountain or hill became a symbol for government. So in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house, that is the government of the Lord's house, will be the highest of all. The highest of all hills, the highest of all governments, the highest government in the world, the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills, the other governments. We're talking about the millennium now. When the Lord Jesus Christ sits on the throne of David and rules the world through the Jewish people from the city of Jerusalem. And people from all over the world will stream there to worship. People from many nations will come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the government of the Lord, the city of Jerusalem, to the house of Jacob's God. There he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion his word will go out from Jerusalem. This is another millennial passage. The Lord will mediate between peoples and will settle disputes between strong nations far away. They will hammer their swords into plowshares, that verse again, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer fight against nation, nor train for war anymore. Everyone will live in peace and prosperity, enjoying his own grapevines and fig trees, for there will be nothing to fear. Everyone will have his own grapevine and fig trees. In an agrarian culture, this is another way of saying everybody's going to be financially secure. You're not going to have any poor people. Everyone will have his own grapevine and fig tree. Everyone will have his own means of production, or everyone will be financially secure. No poverty during the millennium. I want to say, where are the Democrats when you need them? Are they reading the book? Socialists, this is what you want. They should all be beating down the doors in evangelical churches. This is the only hope, folks. I don't want to see poor people poor either, and neither do you. But the ho real hope is, is here in the millennium. Second message, point one, indictment against leaders, priests, and false prophets. Point two, the coming of the Messiah. Point three, Micah predicted the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. We talked about that a moment ago. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, Ephrata is the ancient name for Bethlehem, and it was the ancient name of the Bethlehem that was south of Jerusalem. So you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are small among the rulers of the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. That is, this one born in Bethlehem, this ruler who comes out of Bethlehem, will be God. Okay. Second message, point one, indictment against the leaders, priests, and false prophets. Point two, the coming of the Messiah and his kingdom. Point three, Micah predicted the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Third message, and they only had three, so this is the last one. God invites Israel into his imaginary courtroom. We talked about this at the beginning. God invites Israel to present their complaints. We've been together now 700 years. I delivered you from Egypt. I took care of you in the wilderness married down in uh, the southern Sinai, at, at Mount Sinai. I've, taken, I've been faithful. I gave you the land of Canaan. I prospered you. I gave you victory. You were able to get a stronghold there. And during the time of David and Solomon, you were the most powerful nation in the Middle East. I took care of you. You've been unfaithful to me all these years. So let's go into a courtroom and uh, have a trial. And you can present your complaint and I'll present mine. God invites Israel to present their complaints. God will also present his complaints. God is the prosecutor, and prosecutors forget to present their case first. And uh, he, his case simply is this. He had taken wonderful care of Israel uh, for years, and Israel had not responded as they should. We'll read about in chapter 6. So listen to what the Lord is saying. Stand up and state your case against me. He's saying this to Israel. Let the mountains and hills be called to witness our complaints. What he's doing is calling the mountains and hills everything on earth, in fact, by extension, the whole universe. Let them be a witness. Let the universe be a witness to my complaints against you and your complaints against me. And now, O mountains, listen to the Lord's complaint. He has a case against his people. He will bring charges against Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? What have I done to make you tired of me? Answer me. For I brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to help you. I, the Lord, did everything I could to teach you about my faithfulness. I, I did everything I could to show you that I'm a worthy husband. I'm a God you should be honored to have as your God. What do you, I mean, the world is full of fickle people. 
If you're a businessman, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But you don't have to be a businessman. The world is filled with fickle people. They give you their word. It's not so good. But God says, I worked hard at showing you that I'm faithful. I'm not fickle. What I say I will do, I will do. Not only that, he does more than what he says he will do. And when they sin, he's still gracious and loving and compassionate. What more do you want? Micah responds for the nation. He speaks up for them. He suggests that they offer thousands of sacrifices to make atonement. But he recognizes in the end that would not be sufficient. Let's read what he said. What can we bring to the Lord? In other words, we've blown it big time. What can I say? He's representing the nation. What kind of offering shall we give him? Should we bow before God with offerings of yearling calves? Shall we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? He's, he's, this is an exaggeration, deliberate exaggeration, trying to say, what can we do? All the sacrifices in the world, he will say, ultimately are not sufficient. No, O people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you. And now we're back to that wonderful passage of Scripture. To do what is right. This is what he wants. He wants you to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The sacrifices don't cut it. We could offer lots of sacrifices, but that's not what the Lord wants. He wants us to do what? What is right. To love mercy. And we talked a few weeks ago about guys uh, selling men into slavery because they owed them as little as the amount of money it took to buy a pair of sandals. That's not being merciful. The man had the legal right to do it, but just because you have a legal right to do something doesn't mean you should do it. Where's mercy? So you will, first of all, you should, be, you should do what's right, and then you need to be merciful. Be kind to one another. Help one another. And walk humbly with your God. That means you don't mess around with those other gods. You walk humbly with the one true and living God. God then gives us a sampling of Israel's sins. His focus is on sins against men. His focus is on social injustice. Which I, I say about the homes of the wicked filled with treasures gained by cheating. What about the disgusting practice of measuring out grain with dishonest measures? They were cheating people in the marketplace. How can I tolerate you merchants who use dishonest scales and weights? The rich among you have become wealthy through extortion and violence. Your citizens are so used to lying that their tongues can no longer tell the truth. Now he's talking about everybody, not just, not just Republican businessmen. He's including Democrats here. You're a bunch of liars. Not good. Not good. God then speaks about some of the judgments to come. And he focuses here on preventing them from enjoying the fruit of the labor. There's a lot of ways judgments can come. One of the judgments is the Syrian captivity. One is the Babylonian captivity. And what he also says, you know what? You guys are out there in your field. You're slaving away, trying to grow crops. And you're planting vineyards. And you expect to harvest the grapes and make wine. You have olive trees. You want to squeeze the olives and get lots of olive oil. He says, you know, you're doing a lot of work, and part of my judgment is you can do all that work and you don't get anything out of it. That's part of my judgment. Therefore, I will wound you, God speaking to Israel. I will bring you to ruin for all your sins. You will eat but never have enough. Your hunger, pangs, and emptiness will remain. And though you try to save your money, it will come to nothing in the end. You will save a little, but I will give it to those who conquer you. Put your plant crops you will plant crops but not harvest them you will press your olives but not get enough oil to anoint yourself you will trample the grapes get no juice to make your wine Micah then grieves over people having so few God, Israel having so few godly people this is his sixth point in the third message he's looking for godly people but he can't find any the nation's full of wicked people he says it's like trying to find Godly people is trying to look for fruit after the harvest. How miserable I am. This is Micah talking. I feel like the fruit picker after the harvest who can find nothing to eat. Not a cluster of grapes or a single early food fig can be found to satisfy my hunger. hunger. The godly people have all disappeared. Not one honest person is left on earth. This is a bit of an exaggeration, but the point is it's pretty corrupt in both the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. Just aren't a lot of godly people around. Third message, quick review. God invites Israel 
into an imaginary courtroom. God is the prosecutor. He presents his case first. Micah responds for the nation. God then gives us a sampling of Israel's sins. God then speaks about some of the judgments to come. Michael then grieves over Israel having so few godly people. Michael closes his book with a doxology. A doxology is a short, short hymn of praise to God and his glory. Warren Risby wrote, Michael's final words represent a beautiful example of an Old Testament doxology. It is a brief meditation on God's character, particularly his unfailing love. God doesn't ignore our sins, but in his compassion, he tramples them and throws them into the depths of the sea. This is good news, <laughs> especially for some of us. Micah chapter 7. Where is another God like you who pardons the guilt of the remnant, overlooking the sins of his special people? You will not stay angry with your people forever because you delight in showing unfailing love. Once again, you will have compassion on us, especially during the millennium. Think millennium. You will trample our sins under your feet and throw them into the depths of the ocean. You will show us your faithfulness and unfailing love as you promised to our ancestors, Abraham and Jacob, long ago. In these books, and we'll close here, these books of prophecy, certain repetition. I sort of warned you about that before we began. Keep in mind, that you have a 350-year period from the time the kingdom was divided until the children of Israel were carried off in the Babylonian captivity. That 350-year period was a time of extreme wickedness in Israel. And God sent prophet after prophet after prophet, pointing out to them that they were sinning and rebuking them for it, warning them that if they didn't clean up their act, he was going to punish them, pleading with them to repent so he wouldn't have to punish them, but instead could prosper them. What has that got to do with us? That's a message for us as well. Our culture is rancid. In my short lifetime, or long lifetime, I'm ahead of you. <laughs> In my lifetime, I've seen our culture spiral downward amazingly. We are, we are a wicked and evil culture. We've slaughtered 50, 60 million unborn babies. Folks, that's no small thing. We uh, have embraced sexual immorality to such an extent that the LGBT movement is not only now acceptable, it's not acceptable to even criticize it. And we go on and on and on in sexual immorality, lying, dishonest businessmen, the whole package. Our politicians, we expect them to lie, don't we? Our politicians, we expect them to lie. They all lie. That, I know that's sort of a harsh statement, but unfortunately, we're sort of used to it. We have a culture that's spiraling down. Israel had a culture that was spiraling down. God's message to the Israel from these prophets is also a message to us, and the message is this. I'm not going to put up with your sinful behavior forever. I'm not going to put up with you forever. He hates dishonesty. He hates social injustice. He hates men ripping off their neighbors. He hates men despising God. He will not put up with it forever. So this message is really a message to us as well. If this culture, any culture, thinks it can be sustained over a long period of time with its fist in the face of God and, and filled with sin and injustice and wretchedness, they're kidding themselves. I read these things, and I was reading, I, of course, I have to prepare these, these little lectures, and I read through this, and I think, this is us. God is telling us, you better clean up your act, because if you don't, I'm going to punish you. And you know what? It's not speculation. He did punish them, did he not? We have two big, bad captivities. I mean, can you imagine a whole people being uprooted and taken uh, 800 miles to Mesopotamia from, from, from Israel? That was a severe punishment. And those se severe punishments are in store for us if we don't clean up our act, and I don't think we're going to. Those men and women who are preaching the truths of God's word in today's society are mocked and ridiculed as much as the Israelites rocked and ridiculed these Old Testament prophets. Stop preaching. We want prophets to tell us what we want to hear. And unfortunately, they're not only uh, uh, clerics and false religions will tell people what they want to hear, and professing Christians telling people what they want to hear, like liberals, evangelicals are getting aboard now. I mean, Rob Bell wrote a book, Love Wins, No Hell. 
He's an evangelical. We're not doing the job we're supposed to do. And people are gathering around themselves. People will tell them what they want to hear. Well, you can do that. Like they got all these drunken prophets <laughs> telling them what they want to hear. But it didn't do them any good. They still went off to captivity. And that's the message to us. Pay attention, world. Pay attention. Father, we love you. We worship you. <sighs> we thank you for being our God. And I'm so glad you worked in lots and lots of passages about the millennial reign of Christ because that's our great hope. Our great hope is not that we'll get uh, good political leaders. It'd be nice if we could. Our great hope is in you coming, Lord Jesus, sitting on the throne of David. Then we will beat our swords into plowshares. Then we'll beat our spears into pruning hooks. Then every man will have his own vine. We'll all be prosperous, and we'll live in a world full of righteousness. We're eager for that day. Come soon, Lord Jesus, we pray. Come soon. In your precious name we pray.